into this. So the further you go into science, the more important stats will become. This is something that's often a bit brushed over when we're looking at the high school level. But as I've said, it's very crucial. Um, you'll need to not only be able to interpret stats such as p-values and standard deviations, but also calculate them using technology. Um, and you know, you might have the same experience that I was having where in like chem labs, you need to be able to um, calculate the standard deviation by hand. So like, they give you the equation in the lab manual, but you, know, you need to be able to work this stuff out. Make sure you're very careful and precise with your language when you are talking about statistics. You're likely to initially use Excel, right, if you want to like calculate the mean, calculate the standard deviation. If you want to pursue research, um, honestly, even for if you don't but you're interested in this stuff, I really recommend learning the basics of a programming language such as R or Python. Um, Python is often touted as a very beginner-friendly um, programming language. There's a ton of free resources for it. R is a bit more specialised um, in that it's less like in the general world touted as being great for beginners, but R is specifically designed around statistics. Like Python, it's a higher level of abstraction, so it's more um, closer to like regular talking compared to like using binary code or that kind of thing. Right? So we're not looking at you know super intimidating languages here. Um, and you know if you can learn some of these, but it's so useful, it opens up so many um, doors for you. When I was doing my internship, um, I had a lot of comments from people about like, oh, you know some stats and you know how to use uh, um, how beneficial that is for employability as well. Um, so again, something that I really recommend. Now to go into the more kind of standard content, right? So we've got the standard deviation describing the spread of values around the mean. This is something that you've probably come across um, before, whether in science subject or in a math subject, and the higher the standard deviation, the greater the variation around the mean. Standard deviation is the square root of the variance and has the same units as the mean. So if we think about standard deviation and the process for calculating this, right, you take your mean and then you subtract your individual data points um, to get the difference between your mean and that data point. You add all of those up together, um, square it, divide by um, the amount of data points. So it really is telling you what the standard deviation is, um, how much um, your data points move away um, from what that mean is. And so that's just a basic, what we call descriptive statistic, um, which is useful to describe what the data looks like. But often we don't just want to know about the shape of the data, we want to know how we can interpret that data. And so I'm going to put in a concept here called the null hypothesis. So when we're writing a hypothesis, usually people think about the alternative hypothesis, um, or H1, which is that there is a particular relationship between your variables, right? As angle of launch increases, um, the projectile will go further, or there will be greater horizontal displacement, something like that. But the null hypothesis is that there's no relationship between your variables, right? Null. And in scientific investigations, we're interested in whether or not there's sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. So you might have your data which seems to show a difference between these groups, but can you actually say um, that it, it's just luck, um, or maybe there isn't actually a relationship and you just happen to pick ones when they've got a higher value in this group compared to the other one? So we'll go on to the different errors we can make in terms of hypothesis writing. But to check your understanding, I'm going to ask you to write a null hypothesis. This could be based on your most recent experiment you did in like high school. It could be just a completely random one. But try writing out a null hypothesis for some research. For example, um, I might write that you know, uh, year 9 students will show no difference on test scores, um, whether chewing gum during the test or not. 
you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a super rigorous hypothesis if you don't want to operationalize your variables. I'm not going to have a go for that or anything. You want to make sure you understand the concept. If you do want to operationalize your variables, that's fine. Um, just saying I'm not going to be super clear. Right, exactly. If one plant's watered with tap water, another one with mineral water, there will be no difference in the nourishment of these two plants. So, you know, you might be measuring that in something like growth or the colour, um, but ultimately you're just like, we're not going to see anything going on here, we're going to get the same result. That's exactly um, what we want a null hypothesis to focus on. I did see some typing earlier, but it seems to have gone away, so I will just continue. Then we have two different kind of ways we can go wrong here, right? We can reject the null hypothesis despite it being true. So this is where we go, oh yeah, uh, there is a relationship even though there's not. Um, so for example, if you're taking a like rapid antigen test to see if you have COVID, um, a type one error would be where it says you've got COVID, um, but you actually don't. Whereas a type 2 error would be is if we accept the null hy hypothesis despite it being false. Um, so for example, rapid antigen tests not detecting COVID even though you have it. Um, for the with a rapid antigen test, they are much more likely to have a type 2 error than a type 1 error. Um, so, you know, while they're not perfect, um, very skewed asymmetry on there um, where if the rat says you've got COVID, you probably do. If it says you don't, well, you might anyway, because the type 2 error is much more common. You can see that in this table here, um, where we reject the null hypothesis, but the null hypothesis was true. And um, this type 1 error, and you can see this alpha symbol, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Of course, if we reject the null hypothesis and it's not actually true, great, that's what we want to do. Um, and if we accept the null hypothesis and the null hypothesis is true, then great, we were right. Um, so just want to make sure um, that in particular, we don't want to reject the null hypothesis if it's the case. We don't want to go thinking that there are all these relationships out there. This causes that when that doesn't happen. So we tend to focus a lot more on minimizing the type 1 error than on the type 2. And this is where p-values come in. So a p-value... If I'm going to talk about this really properly, it describes the probability under the null hypothesis that the test statistic is equal to or exceeds the observed value in the direction of the alternative hypothesis. So let's say we've got some data point here, um, some data point there, and then we're like, oh, what's the difference um, between these means? Then the p-value would go, okay, well, what's the probability of having at least that much difference um, 
in order to say that there's a relationship. Or if we wanted to investigate um, the possibility of having like something be broken, um, and we go, oh, okay, well, there were like, you know, this many more broken ones under this condition, we would go, okay, well, what's the chance of finding that many more broken ones, even if this doesn't increase the chance of it breaking? So the p-value is saying, if the null hypothesis is true, what's the probability of getting this result or a more extreme one? And often the test statistic for this is the mean, um, or we're looking at the difference of two means. Often people will describe the p-value as being the chance of obtaining your results due to random luck. This isn't a fully accurate description, um, but it kind of gets the point across in terms of what it's conveying. And where p-values are often used and what people will often think about them in terms of is that if our p-value is less than alpha, then the results are considered statistically significant. Now, alpha is often set to um, 0 0.05. So you can have some differences there where, you know, for example, we're taking a one tail versus a two tail um, statistical test where you, are you going, you know, what if it's just more extreme in one direction versus testing both, um, where that can, you know, alpha can be changed to reflect that. There's some other things we have to be wary of, um, but really what we're interested in is that we want to make sure that there's less than a 5% chance of obtaining those results under the null hypothesis. So if our p-value comes back and it's less than 0.05, we know there's a less than 5% chance that we would have gotten those results if the null hypothesis were true. So then we can feel confident in rejecting the null hypothesis and accepting the alternative hypothesis, saying there is a relationship between these two things. Um, that's what our data shows, that's what we see here. This one should be a pretty quick poll. Researchers, generally, do they want their data to have a high or a low p-value? Remembering that if our p-value is below alpha, then we get to say our results are significant, reject the null hypothesis, accept the alternative hypothesis. All right, we've got our first answer in. Yep, we're in agreement here. Absolutely. Um, being for agreeing, we have a low p-value is generally what researchers want. Then you can say, my results are statistically significant. Um, if you put out your paper and you're like, oh, actually, we're not sure. Maybe this was just due to chance. It could have happened if there was no relationship anyway. Um, you know, that's a lot less exciting. Uh, you're probably going to get less citations and have less impact. You want to have a low p-value, um, so you can say, look, this is meaningful, we do have the relationship. It's not just due to, like, luck in how we were sampling, for example. So, congrats everyone there. So if we're going to be specific with our terminology here, assuming our standard case we've got alpha set to 0.05, if our p-value is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis, accepting the alternative hypothesis, so we're like, yes, there is a um, relationship here. So, of course, it's possible we could be wrong, right? Maybe the null hypothesis was actually true, but we're like, it's unlikely enough that we feel confident saying this is statistically significant. Um, so we now have what's called a significant result, and you don't want to use the word significant unless you're talking about this. You're talking about that statistical mean. If our p-value is not less than alpha, so we've got some bigger number, um, then we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And that language there is a bit careful because we're not necessarily saying that the null hypothesis is true. We're saying, well, we can't be confident enough to say it's not. So maybe it is true, maybe it isn't, um, but we don't have enough confidence to um, say that there is a relationship. We're basically just like maybe. So depending on your results here, you might go, well, maybe with a larger sample size um, and then ha having more statistical power, and maybe we would be able to reject the null hypothesis and say there is a relationship, but at the moment we don't have enough evidence either way.
Often what um, people will use and report are these 95% confidence intervals about their sample statistics. So they might have calculated their sample mean and then they'll go, well, um, I can have 95% chance that the true mean, the population mean, um, lies within this range. So figuring out the size of this confidence interval is going to depend on what kind of statistical distribution your data follows, what sample size you had. Generally, the higher the sample size, that's going to give you more confidence about your statistics. And also the spread of values, right? You might have collected a lot of data on it, but this is something that shows a lot of natural variability, um, and so you've got a wide range anyway. Um, or it might be that, you know, this is something that actually only tends to have a more and at range, you could be pretty confident that the true mean is that, except that you didn't collect enough data. So when we're looking at this 95% confidence interval, um, we can link this back to the standard distribution. Right? With the standard distribution, um, if our fo data follows that, it's normally distributed, um, then we expect that the value will be within two standard deviations of the mean. Usually we're not going to know the population standard deviation, so we rely on the sample standard deviation. So when I'm talking about the population standard deviation, I'm talking about the true one. Right? If we could measure everything and have all of the data in the world, um, this is what we would get when we calculate the standard deviation. But we don't have all of the data, we only have our sample, and so that sample standard deviation is a different value. In this, um, we can use the standard error to quantify our precision around the mean by taking our sample standard deviation and then dividing it by the square root of our sample size. This reflects you know, the sample standard deviation, the variability in the data. Um, if we didn't divide it by the square root of our sample size, that would kind of imply that the more data we get, we're more likely to get some deviations from there. So we correct um, for that by dividing by the square root of our sample size. The more samples we've taken, the more confident we can be that we have a more representative sample and that we actually can see the true values. So again, really important here with language. Um, if two groups have a similar mean, um, then there's a small effect size, right? So you might do your research on your tap water versus your mineral water, um, and then you find that the plants achieve similar height, similar color, they've got um, similar results from that. And so you'd say there's a small effect size, but let's say you did this to a million plants, um, of like this particular type that you were investigating, then you could be pretty confident that even though there was only a small difference, if that difference is showing up again and again, then you're like, well, it's not due to chance. So you might have a statistically significant difference, um, so it would be significant, but it actually is only very small. On the other hand, you might have, when you, you do this experiment and you find that the mineral water plant um, grows a lot higher, it's got a much more lush green colour that we can see and we're like wow there really is a big effect from this but you only tested out like four different plants. Your results are not going to be statistically significant so the results insignificant even though there is a big difference. So make sure you're quite careful when you're discussing effect size and when you're discussing significance that you don't conflate the terms. So if you feel like you want to use the term significant, but you're not talking about statistical significance, try going for something like substantial, meaningful, impactful, in order to talk about you know, whether the difference is such that it would really matter. Again, you can't use the term significant unless you're talking about statistical significance. Make sure you report your p-values. This is going to be included in your results. Um, so if you have a figure with particular p-values attached to it, you would put that into your figure caption. Um, report your sample size. So this will be in the form like n equals, where you then have your number uh, of your sample. When you read scientific papers, pay attention to how they report values, and then kind of copy um, what the conventions are within your field. And I've said this before, um, but be careful with the word significant.